Um, I want to take us to the second panel now and introduce Dr. Dina Chisholm, who will be moderating it. Dina is another member of the planning committee and the nationwide foundation endowed chair in health equity research and director of the Center for Child Health Equity and Outcomes Research and vice president for health services research in the Abigail Wexner Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital. She's also a professor of pediatrics and public health at Ohio State University. Dina? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think it's afternoon for everyone at this point. Um, first of all, um, thanks to the panel before for a great presentation. And so I will move straight into the next panel. Um, our next panel is going to be exceptional because we're going to focus on reacting to what's happened in the first two and a half sessions of this event. So we're gonna to try to put aside all the barriers and constraints that keep us where we are and instead focus our energies and our imaginations on outside the box innovations and equitable approaches to health financing. So in short, we're gonna talk about where we need to be in healthcare financing and how we get there and how we get there fast. So let me start by introducing our three speakers. Um, Emily Brower serves as Vice President of Clinical Integration and Physician Services for Trinity Health. In this role, she provides leadership and strategic direction within the evolving accountable healthcare environment with an emphasis on clinical integration and transformation under alternative payment models. Dr. David Erickson is Senior Vice President at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he heads the community development and economic education teams. He's been a leader in the collaboration between the Federal Reserve and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in bringing the health sector together with community development. And last but not least, Dr. Elizabeth Fowler, is the Deputy Administrator and the Director of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, also known as the CMS Innovation Center at uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dr. Fowler previously served as Executive Vice President of Programs at the Commonwealth Fund and was Vice President for Global Health Policy at Johnson & Johnson. At Johnson & Johnson, she focused on delivery system models and reforms in the US and in the developed and emerging markets. So a great um, mind trust here to figure out where we need to go. And let's um, let Emily kick it off with her version, vision of the future. Thanks so much. Um, and so glad to be with you all today. Um, uh, first, uh, just so I don't disappoint you all, I'm not sure that any of my thoughts on accelerating transformative health financing are all that out of the box. In fact, I would say many of them are in the box if what's in the box is what we know about what works to drive value-based care transformation. And in particular, what we have learned from the grand experiment that uh, we call Medicare ACOs that can be spread. Um, and uh, the other area that um, the conveners asked me to touch on is what can, be, what can we do to bring commercial payers along? So uh, many of those things are actually in that same box. And I will uh, just tie it back to uh, early comments in the workshop by um, Tim Ferriss, um, where he called out that uh, reducing frictional transactional costs between providers and payers is what is going to accelerate um, this transformation. So there are three uh, things that I wanted to touch on in my, in my comments, and there are many other things in that box. Um, but first is, uh, is transparency and um, how that drives collaboration and results. Um, the second is the primary care um, center of models that work and how important that is um, to uh, transforming the care and the healthcare financing. And then lastly, population-based payment models. So the payment model itself, and we've had lots of good conversation um, in the workshop on that that I'm going to reflect on a bit. So that first one about um, transparency. So one of the wonderful things 
about the uh, Medicare ACO model is that Medicare has a known, published, and non-negotiable, at least by any one delivery system, <laughs> fee schedule. And this reduces that friction that um, Tim referred to because it takes off the table fee-for-service rate negotiation. It creates a level playing field among participants, at least in terms of fee schedule. And fee schedule therefore becomes irrelevant, which means you can focus all your energies on improving health outcomes and reducing unnecessary utilization and waste. So it's incredibly freeing. In addition to the focus that that transparency brings, is the collaboration that is fostered by removing any concerns, uh, even of the appearance of anti-competitive behavior. This also came up um, early in the workshop. So when you think about it in the Medicare ACO model, all participants have the exact same transparent contract terms. Participants in the same market that any other day would see each other as competitors come together particularly this was true early on in the ACO journey, to share and accelerate best practices, to learn from each other in order to change faster and go farther than they could go alone. In the Boston market, where I was at the start of the Pioneer ACO model, we included in our application support for all of the other Boston applicants um, because we thought we'd be more successful together. So think of that one system saying to a payer, please include our competitor in this new model and please pay us all the same. We had this idealistic notion that if we got a bunch of the major market players on the same journey in the same contract, maybe we could actually transform the health of a community. So commercial payers do try and foster that kind of collaboration, but there's just not going to be as much transparency and trust that comes from the provider-driven collaboration. Again, free from concern or even any appearance of any competitive behavior. Second in that box is the primacy of the patient primary care provider relationship that is so important to, um, to the model and other models like it. And we talked earlier in the workshop about the concentric circles that flow around the, that um, primary relationship out to the care team, the network of specialists, the full continuum of care and the community supports. So whether you call it a provider driven model or a primary care centered model, at the end of the day, that is the model that, that reflects that we are people caring for people. And the ACO model seems to recognize the humanity of that care that we talked about earlier in the workshop. Um, and, and if we are going to truly organize care around what matters to individuals and communities, we need to support both the supply of and the demand for great primary care. So I was very interested to hear my mention a report um, and bold actions to strengthen the spine of effective primary care delivery. I wrote that down because I love that. Um, so really looking forward to reading more about that. The third is the population-based payment model itself. So like others um, who were uh, earlier in the workshop, I'm not in the capitation is salvation um, uh, camp. Um, but I absolutely do agree that you don't get what you don't pay for. So to pick up on that conversation, the key difference in a population-based alternative payment model or value-based payment model is that the participants are clinically and financially accountable for all the care for the whole year or at least a year. And so instead of creating carve-outs, you are always looking to carve in and you're just going to have way more touch points, otherwise known as coordination of care than you do under fee-for-service or episodic models. If nothing else, you're gonna get into that white space between your own delivery system visits. So even just expanding and pulling those touch points out further. So can we take what works and stretch that um, how do we make the ROI, give the I and the ROI a longer time horizon? And, and it needs to be not the timeline of one individual in one job 
um, which would be uh, you know, your typical commercial model time horizon. And I had the leader of a national health plan told me that's down to seven months. So you need to make an investment that is gonna have an ROI in seven months. So we need those population-based um, payment models stretch that out. So instead of one individual for seven months, you're getting to a family, a lifetime, a community. So my insights from working to scale population health total cost of care models is that we've hardly begun to understand what's in the box of what works and spread those. We've heard some great um, about some great work and accomplishments during the workshop. And if they're not the best practices, they are definitely promising practices that are working. So there's much more that we can do to understand and scale what's in the box. Thank you. So next we're gonna go to David um, and he can tell us what's in his box or what's outside of his box. Um, well, thank you all for having me. I, I wanted to mention that um, you probably don't have a lot of people from the Federal Reserve uh, <laughs> in your conferences. One thing that all of us have to say all the time is that these views are our own. These views that I'm telling you today are my own and that don't reflect those. The views of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. And um, and we were also given like five minutes to jump in and sort of give an overview. So I, I, I apologize. What I'm about to say is going to sound overly simplistic, but I promise you there's a lot of thought behind it. And uh, and it's um, it's all captured in a book that's coming out. Uh, Brookings is publishing in the, in the late summer. So um, so uh, to start, I think, you know, the, the way my sort of breakthrough moment was uh, a visit to Maui. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm fixated on it. I just can't stop thinking about it. And, you know, Maui is a, a beautiful place and, um, it is, uh, although it, it, it is a place that's a former, uh, plantation economy and it has, even though the poverty rate is relatively low there, it's expensive to live in Hawaii. And, uh, and so the poverty and near, uh, sorry, the, 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 the near poverty rates high and the health outcomes are not fantastic. Um, and then there was an interesting development when Kaiser Permanente, which has about 60% of, of the island residents are policyholders. Um, they also, through a series of mergers, uh, got control of all three hospitals on the island. So, so like sort of overnight, they had uh, not only the majority of residents of the island, but they also um, sort of owned readmission risk, which means you own homelessness and a lot of other mental health issues and other issues like that. And so they had something like 80% of the downstream medical care cost risk um, that was basically, uh, and once they realized that, uh, they started talking to preschools because they knew that arriving at kindergarten, ready to learn, uh, was one of the best determinants of future health. And interestingly, of course, they, these are islands, so there's not a lot of churn. Um, to Neil Halfon's point about data, uh, all, all the Hawaiian islands, each one is a, is a county. So all the, all the data uh, that are relevant to sort of health are kept at the county level, of course. So, so they had this built-in sort of um, data infrastructure and they had a lot of organizations that really could work on the upstream social determinants of health. And so they seemed to have this really interesting mix that as I got deeper and deeper into it, what sort of emerged to me was this idea of a market that values health. And, um, and, and, and my liberal friends hate that concept because they always say like, why would you, why would you use something that caused the problem in the first place to solve a problem? But I, I really think the market is a tool and, 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 and I'm gonna go through sort of the elements of it that I think are uh, really uh, uh, have the potential to achieve this much better health outcome. And the way, the, mar the way all markets work is you have buyers, you have producers, and then you have the connectors who connect the buyers to the producers. And in the buyer category, you have many of the, as many speakers said today about braiding the different funding sources, there are lots of entities that are in the business of buying better health outcomes, whether it's health insurers, integrated health systems, hospitals concerned about readmission, as I mentioned, Sue Birch, I thought was an excellent first, uh, example in this category, accountable health communities, government at all levels, foundations, impact investors, which maybe you don't have as much contact with, but these are a growing body of investors who want both a financial and social return on their investments. 
And then there's an additional source of investment that on, uh, th that's available for working on upstream determinants, which is nearly the $300 billion that's invested annually by banks that are motivated by the Community Reinvestment Act. And so there's a, there's a lot of money in this buyer category. In the producer category, you have any entity uh, that can improve the upstream social determinants of health. And I'll go into more detail on that in just one second. Um, and many of those producers of health were on display in day two of this workshop. Um, the connectors are interesting. These can be banks, community development, financial institutions. Those are nonprofit banks. Uh, there about a thousand of those in the country and other mechanisms like maybe the Vermont statewide ACO. But two quick examples to give you a feel for this. One is the Healthy Futures Fund, which is a joint creation from the Kresge Foundation, Morgan Stanley, the investment bank, and local, the Locals, Local Initiative Support Corporation, a CDFI. And that uh, really tries to channel money into uh, the development of federally qualified health centers. But in order to get access to, to this below market financing, you have to really adopt the John Castle concept of treating the whole neighborhood as the patient. You really have to think more holistically about improving population health. Another example is the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund in Boston. And this was a, a fund that was created in response to the simple question my friend Maggie Superchurch who like, that's like the greatest name ever, but it really just is Maggie super married Bruce Church. So it's not that interesting really. But anyway, she has this question. Why can I buy stock in a company that makes a pill that lowers blood pressure, but I can't invest in a neighborhood that does exactly the same thing, measurably the same thing. Um, and both of these funds just make it easier for banks to invest with hospitals and other impact investors to work on the upstream determinants of health. That, and that, that's why that, that, that connector category is so, so important. Now in the producer category, um, we, what we need is entities that can improve places, neighborhoods, and invest in people. And I combine, I call this combined place-based and people-based approach, um, guardrails and airbags. That's the name of the book. Guardrails are aspects of a well-functioning neighborhood that nudge and guide us to build the skills we need to thrive in adulthood, good schools, well-funded libraries, safe streets and public spaces, quality healthcare, spiritual homes, well-functioning transportation that puts other essential amenities in reach, especially jobs. And airbags, on the other hand, this is an idea I stole from uh, Robert Putnam and his book, Our Kids, but these are the things that kind of deploy when you need them. These are what like super moms do. This is what, you know, if you if you are in a situation where you're, de you're experiencing depression, you get counseling. If you had a drug overdose, you get drug rehab. These are the things that can, ex can uh, deploy at a moment of need. And, and the way you pay for this, basically, are through what I call the twin revolutions of pay for success financing for social services, and the population health business model. Um, there is a lot of money in the social welfare system that people don't quite recognize. So one of the problems I have with uh, the, Amer the book American Healthcare Paradox is they compare US spending on direct expenditures but don't take into, into account tax uh, motivated uh, investments in the so social welfare system. And when you do that, and you can Google this, the OECD does this every year, the, the United States, uh, it outspends every other country on earth except for one. France spends more money on social welfare. Um, oh, I'm getting my, I'm getting the hook. Um, so that is, uh, oh, I'm trying a new, uh, a new speaker uh, clock and it just, it just made my whole screen go blank, sorry. But the other, um, the other source, of course, is that we spent almost a trillion dollars a year treating chronic disease that's both avoidable and the byproduct of living in poverty. So, so there, and there are lots of mechanisms where you can get uh, third party investors to take the risk on some of these, um, these investments in neighborhoods in guardrails and airbags that if they produce a savings in medical care costs, you could get investors to come in and build that new rail uh, for a, a different type of system that promoted health. I've gone on too long. I really apologize. I'm going to uh, stop here and hopefully we can get into more of these details in the questions. Definitely. So um, our final of the threesome is um, Dr. Elizabeth Fowler, who arguably has the biggest sandbox to play in of all of us um, with her leadership role in Medicare and Medicaid and responsibility for figuring out how we innovate in that space. So I'm going to turn it over to her for that vision. Great, thank you, Dina. And my, uh, it also says I can't turn on the video. Oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so first, thanks for the chance to be part of this panel and this compelling workshop. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective and, 
and that of the Biden-Harris administration. And I'll try to be blue sky in my response. Um, it's been really heartening to see so many examples of success and promising in approaches um, in delivery system and payment reform, including many of the initiatives and ideas discussed in day one and day two of this workshop. Um, on the other hand, I wanna be uh, realistic that our health system can't resist the siren song of the status quo. Um, and there's across modern history, so many attempts um, to implement or test new approaches and somehow we, we end up being pulled back um, to our place. So I wanna be um, appropriately blue sky, but also try to be realistic. So how do we resist the status quo and keep up the momentum for real change? Based on lessons uh, learned from CMMI and based on experiences shared by speakers from the previous days, in my perspective, um, first, I'm really heartened by the renewed interest in advanced primary care and doubling down on the role that primary care can play in a high performing health system. Um, several recent recommendations highlight this opportunity, including the recent report by the National Academies. Um, we also need to move in the direction of total cost of care models and with the right set of incentives and resources, I really do believe providers can get on board. And I think these concepts are directionally related. Uh, we can move toward total cost of care by making sure all patients, starting with Medicare, are in a relationship with an accountable care entity, including an alignment, um, including alignment with an advanced primary care practice. So this includes ACOs, um, direct contracting entities, managed care, and other avenues. And this is perhaps the crux of the blue sky that I would want to frame. Um, I also think there's palpable enthusiasm across the health system to advance equity. So that's very exciting and we need to build on that momentum to accomplish real change and would love to get into more detail about how CMMI is thinking about that. But um, every conversation I have with any entity starts with um, a discussion of health equity and the steps that um, those stakeholders are taking to address this important issue. Um, I was really pleased to see all the interest in partnering with community-based organizations. If we really want to address structural determinants of health, these partnerships are really critical. And the old adage that all politics is local might also apply to healthcare. Um, and then I also want to um, go back to the realistic part and talk about some of the challenges that we need to overcome as part of our blue sky. Um, what we've learned from CMMI models over the past 10 years is that um, sometimes voluntary models don't work um, if you wait for people to join and um, hold out hope that, that um, um, people jumping on board will, will change the system. I think there, we've obviously made a lot of, um, a lot of progress, but, um, but I think we are looking at CMMI on, um, at exploring mandatory models and which come with their own set of disadvantages, but that's, um, that's part of the reality that we're facing. I think we need to make fee-for-service more uncomfortable it's just currently too comfortable to remain in fee-for-service and macro was supposed to drive providers towards APMs. And I think we need to revisit those incentives. And this one is a little bit weedier, but I think it's important. I think we need better risk adjustment so that innovation is around care delivery and outcomes and not just about gaming the system and upcoding. Um, there's also a related notion of making sure that we have a level playing field. So all providers that wanna participate in our new reformed blue sky system um, are on an equal footing. And I know Emily knows exactly what I'm talking about because we've had this conversation before. I think it's really important that we're not disadvantaging some players while we're overly advantaging others. Um, but we want the focus to be on care delivery and improving outcomes and not just coding for the sake of higher payments. And finally, we need the data infrastructure that's gonna support all of the goals and initiatives we've discussed um, in this work, workshop um, to measure and reward better care, improved outcomes, to support integration and coordination and health equity. Um, and that data needs to be timely and current. So I got, I'm almost at my buzzer. I have a couple more minutes, but um, just let me close by saying it's a really exciting time to be working on these issues and appreciate the opportunity and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Excellent. So that's that's a great uh, starting point for us to spend a little under 30 minutes talking about 
um, ideas, and including ideas that have come out uh, during the past two and a half sessions. So I got a great set of notes um, summarizing the critical opportunities for action uh, from the first um, sessions. Um, and I'm gonna name five of them with a little detail. Um, and just so you're prepared, I'm gonna ask each of you, which one of these made your heart flutter? And which one made your heart say, yes, that's what we need to do. Cause that's what I wanna hear your reaction to. So here's the five. Process redesign and smarter payments that focus on, less focus on short-term ROI and more focus on longer needs, um, including payment for health-related social needs, payment for connective tissue infrastructure and interoperability, um, and braiding and blending approaches that address social determinants of health. So that's one. Two, collaboration with a collective will to focus on whole person and population health. So building community networks, building off of what we've been doing with the COVID experience and the opioid experience, supporting communities, envisioning what they want to be and driving their own initiatives, um, and then rebalancing spending to account for the system's optimal level of responsibility and delivery at a community level. That's two. Number three, systemic cultural changes that remove barriers, listen to communities, eliminate bias, and build bi-directional trust and creating political buy-in. Four, meaningful outcomes measurement. I'm an epidemiologist. I do lots of outcomes measurement, so hopefully this excites somebody. Um, along a framework of morbidity, mortality, patient reported outcomes, and equity. And then finally, federal and state action, regulating overinflated pricing, expanding pandemic era, era stimulus packages to mitigate barriers to entry, um, and reasonably re-examining antitrust and competitive practice regulations to allow for increased efficiency and collaboration between systems. Some of the things that we were able to build on the fly during pandemic, but how do we keep them alive? So process redesign, collaboration, cultural change, meaningful outcomes measurement, or federal action. Uh, which one of those um, generates the most excitement in your heart about getting us to where we need to be quickly? Are we uh, just jumping in? Yes, <laughs> please go ahead, Emily. <laughs> All right, so I choose door number two, um, uh, collaboration. And um, some of that has to do, you know, we just, we're all so right now, I think, influenced from our experience um, with responding to COVID. And that was such, that was such a big, big one for us. Um, we, uh, it, we, we, it turns out um, that uh, COVID tested these models and these models responded with strength. And so um, the same kind of blocking and tackling that I would say those who are doing population-based payment models have built that muscle just sort of pivoted and flexed um, understanding the population, who's at risk, outreach, care plans, all that good stuff, right? We just, we just did that. That was sort of our usual work. But the additional piece and the, and the connection to number four is that we had, to, we had to build into our network. And I know others did as well because there are all these great resiliency case studies around COVID. And we had to more align with that community-based network because we needed to bring the home and community-based services to the patients. Um, we needed uh, to make sure that they had meals delivered, um, home delivered meds, like just some of the things that sound very basic. And I would say we would have assumed that we were connecting with, but that um, burning platform, it had to happen and it had to happen quickly. So we set up social care hubs right alongside our um, population health um, teams to be able to facilitate that and quickly found out who were those community partners who were ready and able to respond. And so um, that, you know, that's, that's why um, I think that one um, really uh, uh, called to me. 
I um, and and I know that many of us are trying to figure out how to build those into these models. How do we have specific goals? Because, you know, left without that uh, clear accountability or that burning platform, you know, you have um, payment models where, um, you know, people will say, well, gee, can, do we have to be accountable for everything? Can we possibly be accountable for everything? And there was earlier conversation in the workshop about that. Right? Can you say, oh, you health system or practice, you now have to be accountable for um, those community services as well. So I'm, I'm not coming with the answer to that question, but that's a place I think um, not just I, but many of us want to work on, even if we're just talking about how do we make sure that we're making the right referrals and we're closing the loop and pulling those um, services into the care plan, authentically including those service providers on the care team. And there has been some really innovative work on that, particularly in the, um, in the work for those who are duly enrolled. I think there are lots of great examples around that. And then, and then of course, COVID as well and how we all responded to that. So that's a pretty exciting place. Well, I will jump in and maybe it's no surprise that I'm going to choose federal and state regulation <laughs> pricing and re-examining competition. Um, I, you know, the, the, the more specific bullets and from the discussion, um, you know, that CMS should advance accountable health communities, move beyond small episodic waiver to think about nationally scalable, globally budgeted and innovative supported Supportive financing, to me, that is what makes my heart flutter. And if we could get to that point, um, I'd be really excited. And then the other part of that coin is um, state and federal legislators, uh, le legislatures who um, invest um, portion of every delivery dollar. And you know, here I'm thinking of some of the innovative models out there, like the Vermont, um, the multi-payer ACO model, the Maryland total cost of care model, that there are, you know, things going on that are out there that are really exciting. Um, so, you know, I guess the only caveat to that is that I've worked with David Blumenthal now, and uh, he's always cautioned me that that regulation and, and um, you know, federal policy can only go so far and you really need that. Um, it's not gonna change the way that care is delivered um, and provided and that you're not necessarily, you can only get so far with payment changes. And so um, I realize there might be some limitations, but, but I guess the vision of trying to do a lot of this from, from a post at CMS as the country's largest health payer is, is exciting. David, do you want to yeah, jump I don't want to disappoint you. So I want to focus on outcomes. <laughs> so, <laughs> And you know, what, and I'm like taking a weird direction, I, but uh, it, it's, you know, you can't have a real estate market without surveyors. You know, at some point you have to know what you're buying. And, you know, I think we know that on average, a high school graduate pays almost a million dollars more in taxes than a high school dropout. And there's, we could come up with a lot of those measurements about if you could hit this outcome, it would free up some resources somehow that you could use for the upstream interventions that will make sure that you get to those outcomes. And, uh, Friend of mine, Dina Bravada, has she she helped start a company called Lyric, which is, it provides um, mental health services. And something that's super interesting, she's been going through the data. They have like a hundred thousand patients or clients now. And she said, yeah, she said it's really interesting. What what predicts future need of, of mental health um, intervention? And she said some things you would makes perfect sense. If you had a heart attack in year one, breast cancer in year one, you often need counseling in year two. But she said as predictive as that was whether or not you skipped a, a dentist appointment. And you start thinking like how many other canaries in the coal mine are like that? How many more are, uh, examples are there where we could have visited somebody at a time when they, we, they were losing interest in their oral health and, and say, hey, we're just checking in on you. Can we, can we help you with anything? Or maybe help smooth out their income and expenses or maybe provide them with some counseling. These are the kind of things that if we had the proper outcome system and we had a proper data system, I think we could start building around not only the interventions, but we could start capturing the savings and paying for those interventions upstream. 
Excellent. And, and you've made me happy, made my, made my day. Um, one of the quotes that came out on day one, and I'm sorry, I don't have in my notes who actually said it, but they were quoting somebody else, uh, which was only doctors and nurses can change healthcare, but healthcare is too important to be left to doctors and nurses. Now, I don't think, I think that's a very sort of overstatement that only doctors and nurses can change healthcare. But if you say that only the healthcare system can change healthcare um, and healthcare is too important to be left to the healthcare system, that may be a truism. Um, but the sort of addition to that was maybe healthcare can't do it alone. Maybe healthcare is the quarterback of a bigger team, or maybe sometimes not the quarterback. Maybe they're the receiver, or maybe they're the lineman. So when we start thinking about health as opposed to healthcare, where does healthcare fit in the equation? Is it the quarterback or is it just a player on the team? You know, I thought about that because I saw that quote and my first reaction was that why not healthcare given that it's, you know, almost 20% of the GDP and carries so much weight and um, why not um, give the responsibility of, of helping to manage these, um, these costs, these diseases, these um, factors that influence people's health, um, understanding the limitations and, and all that goes along with it. But I guess that was my first reaction when I read that. And just to pick up on that, maybe somewhere in there is healthcare as it's structured today. You know, so we can't leave it to healthcare as it's structured today, right. where you have these vertical silos, right? And so it's it is about, in fact, that connective tissue and what happens, the white space between visits and those other things that we all talk about. That that's why we can't leave it to that traditional siloed healthcare system as it is organized today and as it is paid for today, because back to the earlier um, truism, perhaps you don't get what you don't pay for. Um, so I do think healthcare has to be a big part of the solution to healthcare, but I get the spirit, I think, behind that question, which is not as we do it today. It absolutely has to be different. We have to have the accountability for the things that we don't deliver and the things that we, we prevent from happening. And you know, you're only gonna get that through the kind of payment models that we've been talking about for, the, for this, over this workshop. Yeah, I, I, I hate to be the unpopular guy at the party, but like I, I think you know Michael McGinnis's work really just is started a whole trend of understanding that the big drivers of health are outside the doctor's office. So I would say uh, we want we want the healthcare system to be um, uh, supple in its approach and 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 aware of the other partners it can it can uh, partner with. But I think the real driver. Um, the real driver for improved health is outside the doctor's office. It's in neighborhoods, it's in families, it's in schools. Okay, so we can't do it alone. I think that we can all agree with that statement. And even a quarterback on the field by himself is not going to win the game. So we've got to think about that. The other, you know, excitement or other thing that sort of keeps me up at night um, is the question of equity. And I think that it has come up many times across the three days, including today. Um, and I am challenged to believe that doing more of what we're doing now is going to address the problem. Um, that we have spent you know, the last couple of decades incentivizing people to do the exact same thing for every patient, um, knowing that that just doesn't work because never, not every patient starts at the same place or has the same needs. What specifically do we need to do to address equity, um, address these you know, seemingly intractable gaps in outcomes uh, explicitly in the way we design the next iteration of what we do? So I can, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, and there's 
there are just so many levels to that, right? I think we have to all acknowledge there's everything from absolutely declaring and acknowledging that racism is a public health crisis all the way to those individual actions that we can all take. So I feel like we could go anywhere, but I'm gonna just uh, take us to, you know, it, it, in, in my organization at Trinity Health, right, we have actions at all those different levels. So the public health and advocacy all right down to um, hiring and, and creating healthcare teams. Um, I'm gonna say how it, uh, how it worked through with my team as we looked at some of those outcome measures, Dina, that you love and, and we said, where are we seeing, continuing to see unaddressed disparities? And if we go right to that spot and say, we're gonna focus um, our care model to address that, we will, we will, you know, we will advance at that level as well. And where we ended up going to is we've, you know, just got a lot of work on reducing ambulatory care sensitive condition admission. So that ARC measure that many of us know and love. And when we, um, when we split that out, we saw no surprise, right? Still, we continue to have tremendous racial and ethnic disparities in those, in that measure, and all of those underlying uh, measures such as diabetes, COPD, CHF, so those who are familiar with that um, and that measure. So we said, okay, so a different, what we're doing today isn't working, a different care model um, for that population. And we uh, brought our community health worker team and we said, you're, you're now part of the team that prevents ambulatory care sensitive condition admissions um, for the population where we see this um, continued and historic and, and sort of just really hard to change um, disparities. So we have a different care model um, now for those populations and for those specific diseases where we see the greatest disparity. And we are building on you know, what I think at this point, going back to in that box, we do see as a, a good evidence-based um, community health worker model. So they actually are the, the care coordinator for those patients, um, really understanding the way a good community health worker does, what are those uh, drivers for that individual person, their family and their community, they're creating the care plan with the patient and we'll keep tracking it because it's a measure we report on every single month. And so we'll be able to see if we're if we're having some um, if we're having the impact we expect to have. So just one example, but like really specific and practical action. Sure. Uh, so um, David or Liz, if either of you want to chime in to think about how we are explicitly building closing gaps into our redesign of the healthcare system, if that's what we're trying to do. I'd say again, if I were sort of take a step beyond, because this is blue skies, so we can maybe step out of the healthcare system for a moment. But I, you know, one of the things I'm really moved by is John Powell's ideas around targeted universalism. And so like, for example, one of the things we're working on is a, is a coalition in the New York metro area that combines city and county, uh, Robert Johnson Foundation, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and um, uh, the the Low Income Investment Fund, and and the what we're and and the and the NYU School of Nursing, and one of the things that we're really focused on is maternal and child health, which is mind blowingly unequal in terms of outcomes, especially based on race. And so we just have to get a hundred times smarter about what the interventions are. And so one of the one of the interventions that the city is now going to do is. They're going to they're going to vi visit every expecting mom in the city. It's, that's like hundreds of thousands of women in a city of 18 million people. And then we're going to layer on that in that moment an analysis of their housing and, and work situation. And then the local investment fund is trying to find ways in which they can create a better uh, funding model for zero to three care, so that we have uh, very high quality home care for kids. That is a triple win. It allows. Uh, it provides a high quality job in that neighborhood. It provides an opportunity for the, the parent to go uh, find work and it gives enrichment to the child zero to three. So, so we think that things like that 
are with substantial funding, the Low Income Investment Fund has a big chunk of money from uh, McKinsey Scott and from the pandemic relief effort. So they have the money to pursue this. Uh, the Just Births Initiative at Robert Wood Johnson is also funding, putting some money towards this. So, so I think that things like that, we just have to like, we just have to be super aggressive and just start targeting as many of these sort of disparities as we can. And I think from, from our perspective, um, we're just starting to ask a lot of questions and then thinking about um, for the models that we have in the, in the field now, asking questions about, um, you know, send us your results. What's the impact um, by race and ethnicity? Um, how, how, are, how are different populations faring under these models? In some cases, we hadn't been asking those questions, so we might not be able to get that data or it might not be reliable. But then going forward for all of the models, I think we're looking at taking a very different approach um, to thinking about um, advancing health equity and addressing structural racism. And that is, um, are there models that we could pursue specifically to address these issues? And then for the models that we are pursuing, um, making sure that we're asking for that data upfront. Um, and then we're also asking model participants, or we will be asking model participants, like who's in your model? Where, where are the providers located? What patients are they serving? Um, can you demonstrate that, um, that you're gonna make a difference for underserved areas? And we're collecting the data at least on a, a larger scale to be able to look at that across the model. So for direct contracting, for example, we've gone back and looked at participants. Where are they participating? What zip codes? Um, what are the patients that they serve? And actually we wanna see that it's gonna make a difference for all patients. And you're not just going into uh, you know, suburban areas that you're actually you know, putting your money where your mouth is and um, you know, thinking about how to, how to make the world a better place for everybody, for all patients, for all people. Excellent, okay, so we've got five minutes left and I am going to take a question from the audience that has been uh, put into the chat. Um, and it is directed at Dr. Fowler, but I think others might want to respond as well. And the question is, in a webinar last month, one of the former CMMI leaders said that absent a requirement to change, systems just won't change. And that making transformation mandatory is the only way forward. Um, so the question is, is that true? Can we only transform through mandate? And is that a blue sky or is that a dark sky point of view? I, I mean, I think it's, this is what we're struggling with now. Um, and that is if you have these sort of episode models where you know maybe people participate, maybe they don't, but everyone does the math and they figure out whether they can win or not. Um, on the other hand, making them mandatory as we are going to do, and you'll see we're starting to unveil some more of these models, um, meets with a lot of resistance. Um, we've sort of hinted around that one model might become mandatory and we've already gotten a, um, a threat of lawsuit um, before we've even put it out there. We haven't even talked about what it would look like. Um, so, you know, I think it depends on what part of the system you're talking about. On the other hand, we haven't made ACOs mandatory. Um, and, and a lot of those, you know, look at, you know, Emily, I'm sure, participating in next gen, it was there, they wanted to embrace that model and they wanted to go in that direction. Um, we have providers signing up for MSSP and direct contracting, hopefully doing it for the right reason, but we, but we haven't been able to get there to that point in my blue sky, which was everybody's in one of these models. Everybody's aligned with a provider. Everybody's in a system where some provider or entity is looking out for their care. And, and so now, you know, really big sky and going back to that federal point I made about, you know, how, how that was sort of my preferred approach was this federal state regulation, um, you know, really thinking about nationally scalable, globally budgeted, you know, innovative um, sub innovation supporting financing and thinking about whether we need to think, you know, bigger picture and really push in that direction using a mandatory model. So, it, you're raising a good point because it's one of the things we're really struggling with now. Anybody else think we can get to blue sky without mandates? I, I'm not a fan of mandates. I think, um, and you might, it may not come as a surprise, but I think competition is the better approach. Um, you know, Adam Smith talks about this transition from a medie medieval economy to the modern economy in his book, The Wealth of Nations. And he tries to figure it out. And it basically, there were these small city states 
um, in Northern Europe that had this sort of what looked like a very modern capital and labor arrangement that just started out competing the feudal uh, societies around them. And so um, I, what I didn't make, the point I did not make was, which is key, is that I think there are many Maui's all around the country where someone owns the downstream medical care cost risk. And I think if we had 10 of those that switched over to a population business model, they were islands of population health, and they outcompeted the rest of the country. I think they would, um, as, as, as Smith says, there were, these, these cities were islands in a feudal sea, and I think these would be population health business model islands in a fee-for-service sea. And once they showed much better outcomes, much better equity outcomes, health outcomes, we would start seeing the world start, the systems begin to bend to that model. And I think that would be a more effective way than mandating it. And, and you're assuming a level playing field for the competition too. So <laughs> like if competition really works and we really want it to work, there's gotta be transparency, fair pricing, fair rules, like, if we get to do that, then maybe we don't need the mandates, but um, you know, fix our risk adjustment problem, level that playing field, make sure that everyone's on the same footing, but you know, also make sure that, you know, that all populations are getting taken care of. And so you're not seeing you know, this sort of, what is it, lemon dropping and cherry picking you know, behaviors that leaves out some populations, which is why we have some of the problems that we have. So um, I, don't, I don't completely disagree, but want to see that level playing field. So I was going to say I love David's vision, but the how and how we create that level playing field is the reality that Liz has to live with, right? And I would say we are completely prepared for bundles to be mandatory, um, but getting back to you know something that has been talked about for a long time. Um, so I, I love the vision. I'm prepared for um, some of those realities because I think as a, as, a, as a payment model or as a payer, we have not figured out, no one has figured out how to create that level playing field. And I would go back to some of those themes about what works and the transparency in that those are all helps. Those all help connect those two. Uh, pieces, but, and so I love the get there through competition. I am prepared for <laughs> some level of, of mandatoriness. <laughs> we didn't make DRGs optional, uh, <laughs> just going back to that. That's true. Excellent. And we are just out of time. Um, I want to thank this amazing panel for a great discussion and for helping us to sort of think about our boxes, but also take the lids off of it and let some of the blue sky in. And thank you for making that possible.